coming to our Caskey Speaker Series. We are excited to have with us Miranda Bogan. She works for uh, Team Upturn, or Upturn, okay. <laughs> um, and she is going to be talking with us today about automated decisions and the black box of algorithms, which I'm sure a lot of us have been hearing a lot about. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, and thank you for inviting me. Um, first of all, this is the first time I've presented this work, so it might be a little rough around the edges, so feel free to interrupt me um, if anything's not clear. But this is basically, um, so first, a bit about Upturn. We are a, a nonprofit think tank based in DC that works at the intersection of civil rights and technology policy, and so we do everything from police use of technology to fairness and accountability and machine learning to, uh, you know, just really any, any place where um, a new technology is affecting how traditional civil rights are implicated and, and traditional civil rights groups not, don't necessarily have the capacity to think through how this might affect um, their work and their communities. And so uh, this, uh, this research was a big project where, where uh, we were working with the Omidyar Network um, to look at you know, what does it look like for the public to have more visibility into automated decisions? What does public scrutiny of automated decisions look like? Is it happening? What are the different methods? Um, and what else can we learn about the ecosystem by just taking sort of a broad look at that? And so what we did was um, we collected about 100 different instances uh, where someone who did not have privileged access to an automated system was nevertheless able to learn something about that system and have some sort of public conversation or debate about that system. Um, because there, you know, there's this sense that everything is in a black box, everything is inscrutable and uh, proprietary and closed off, and we were just seeing examples where that wasn't necessarily the case, and so our, our hope was that our findings would help empower researchers and um, civil rights groups and other public interest and advocacy groups to do more of the of the scrutiny that we need to talk about whether these systems are appropriate, under what conditions, what are the fairness constraints, what are the um, you know legal and regulatory approaches that we need as these systems proliferate. So, um, so we looked at those cases and we kind of uh, distilled from that um, a number of, of of things about what we thought makes up an automated decision and and. We looked at across the world at how different countries were um, beginning to approach regulating these types of decisions. And, um, and so I'll just go through some of that, and then I would love to hear if we missed anything. <laughs> um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with the uh, ProPublica article that really kicked off a lot of conversation about um, automated decisions and whether they're fair, um, finding that there were uh, error rates in predictive um, risk scoring at bail um, was imbalanced um, to disfavor uh, black defendants, so they were um, being erroneously uh, highlighted as uh, flagged as a higher risk than than white defendants were, and that kicked off kind of a debate between the ProPublica researchers and North Point, which was the software vendor um, for that system, about what fairness metrics they were using and whether it was appropriate and the vendor really thought that they had kind of taken steps to mitigate unfairness but uh, you know this article really s sparked um, a heated debate over the mathematical definitions of fairness and and so that was kind of new but there are also historical uh, <laughs> cases where um, software made an error and um, Investigators, or investigators had to figure out what was going on, so we kind of looked, like, looked back at some older examples. Um, the Patriot missile failed to shoot down uh, uh, an incoming missile, I think it was in the Gulf War, and there was an investigation after that, so they, they did a long investigation um, of what happened there. And then there's ones that don't quite, that it was hard to tell whether this was an algorithm problem, whether it was a company problem, um, but there was a sense that a tool that was automatically surfacing news on Facebook um, was biased, or, or whether the people were biased, or whether, you know, what was driving this tool, and then later on when they switched to um, a fully automated system because they thought that bias was happening, it ended up surfacing a ton of false news stories, and so there was an unintended consequence there. Um, 
but there was a lot of good conversation and debate without anyone ever having access to the internal um, algorithm that was ranking and sorting these news articles. So that was an interesting case as well. And so, has anyone seen this video? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes the system, there's like clearly something wrong with it, and you don't really have to dive into the, the code to understand what the problem is. Really, something wrong there. You don't have to to open up the code to say this is a problem, and we need to 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 talk about it and, and figure out how to fix this in the future. And it's just a good illustration of not everything is so complicated that you need to um, crack open the code and open the black box. Black box. Maybe at some point you do, but to have the conversation about whether this is appropriate, uh, you don't need to. <laughs> it's pretty clear. So when we looked at the 100 different cases, um, we saw that people were looking at different components of these systems. And when we talk about, you know, at first this was framed as, as a lot of people like to frame it as algorithms, but I think what probably many of you appreciate is that these are um, really larger sort of socio-technical systems that involve not only the code, but also the people who use them, the rules that govern them, you know, what data was used, um, all sorts of things. And so we, we looked at these cases and saw that people were attacking this from various angles, and so we um, we wanted to get out of the notion that this is all about the source code, um, and also to kind of disabuse people of the notion that like, the complex black box makes everything impossible to scrutinize because there are so many dimensions and um, we don't have access to the data and, and whatnot. So what we found was there were eight sort of distinct components of an automated decision system, and I'll go through them, but, you know, a couple of them fall into what we called insights, which was um, not necessarily concrete uh, documentation about a system, but, you know, something that you could observe about it, something that um, you could have a conversation about without having any access to the system. Um, and then there were artifacts, which were more concrete um, things that you might need a little bit more access to, you might need to um, at request or obtain in some other way, but that could get you and it could get you a little bit more information. And they also kind of go back and forth, like by getting policies of a system, you could learn more about um, the purpose of it, or you could learn more about what we call the constitution, or sort of where do humans fit in, what components of the system um, triggers what action. Um, so firstly, we thought to have any conversation about an automated system, you have to know that it exists. That was the prerequisite for so many conversations. There were um, a lot of good work, there's a lot of good work coming out of, um, I think, Nick Diakopoulos when he was here about just FOIAing for the existence of algorithmic systems and trying, making that public so that people could do the type of scrutiny and review that you would need to have that conversation. Um, so this, this came up recently. Um, about ex the extreme vetting initiative um, when it became clear that the administration's goal was to use machine learning to vet potential immigrants. That's really all people had to know to kind of start a debate over whether this was appropriate. Like how could we possibly determine what uh, a successful, you know, contributing member of society was or um, you know, talk about just in broad terms the, how difficult it would be to predict um, violent or, or terrorist events from this so few cases, um, just in terms of how machine learning works. So all they really needed to know was the existence of that system to start that conversation. So secondly, uh, the purpose. So if you're looking at the extreme vetting uh, system, they were trying to determine, as I mentioned, um, who would be a valuable contributing member of society and who, who might go on to commit a terrorist act. And recognizing what those things are, um, computer scientists kind of came together and said, you know, those are A, really difficult, we have no definition for what that means, and B, computationally difficult um, given the type of data we have. And so you could imagine if, if the purpose, if we had a clearer sense of the purpose of that system, which was which could be, for instance, like e economic contribution, then maybe you could say that a, you know, an, an automated decision system would be appropriate 
to project um, or to predict how how much someone might contribute economically, but in the definition that they were proposing, or that people anticipated that they would propose, it didn't really make sense for a predictive system. Um, and then it's something you can judge a system against later on if you know that it was trying to predict um, recidivism, but the data it was using was based entirely on sort of police activity and not actual, um, you know, not comprehensively all criminal behavior, you can have a debate over whether the system was built to actually fulfill the purpose it was defined for. So having a clear sense of that definition um, lets you kind of evaluate other things in terms of that purpose. So then constitution, and this is one of the things we were kind of most excited to, uh, to distill from our findings, is that really understanding at what point the automation comes into a decision and at what point and how much discretion a human has is really important to to think about you know what are we really scared of here is it that the, the automated system is like making life and death decisions about someone or is it that they're you know putting out sort of a confusing and ambiguous numerical score that people don't know how to interpret and that we think that the human bias that an automated system might be trying to eliminate still can come into play because we haven't appropriately accounted for you know where the humans come in there or we're not giving or we're putting a human in to kind of rubber stamp an automated decision and and what does that mean for whatever decision is, is happening here so um you know self-driving car <laughs> they're putting um human drivers in but hiding them <laughs> i just think that's a really funny image but um if any of you haven't read um Madeline Elif's paper, I think it's called um, Moral Crumple Zones, is one sort of th thought experiment around here of, you know, when you put a human into an automated uh, automated decision system, are they are they really there to provide oversight, or are they the one to kind of absorb liability or blame if that system goes wrong? And understanding exactly what's like how much um, agency that a human has in that system can let you know whether that's the case or whether they have. Sort of meaningful, um, meaningful oversight, ability to contest a decision or to, to include data that might not have been able to be included in a computational um, prediction. So, for example, a comp the, the constitution of a credit scoring system, uh, a credit scoring algorithm, is that it's the this is what creates the score, right? We're just talking about the score here. So you have the the data in the credit file. Um, that goes into the scoring algorithm, that then it comes out with a numerical score. So that's the constitution of a credit scoring system. But when we're talking about credit underwriting, that's a different, uh, a different, a system with a different constitution. So you have the original, the credit scoring system, but then you have a larger system that has a second, perhaps automated component here, which is the um, credit application, where perhaps they have a cutoff for what score would um, trigger what interest rate, for instance, or whether you had access to credit at all. And that could be an entirely automated system as well. There might not be a human involved in that, at least not in sort of like pre-approval for, for credit, for instance. But so that's credit scoring and then that's credit underwriting. But for a mortgage application system, that's likely to have more of a human component where they're looking at the credit score, but they're also looking at mortgage application and they're making perhaps a, a guided decision. They might have policies they have to follow, but there is a human there that can take different factors into account. And understanding that about a system gets you a long way to understanding um, what are the pieces of the system that you're actually concerned um, that, that might be harming subjects of that decision, for instance, and, and where could you um, apply levers of pressure or, or policy to make sure that the, the system is not doing something that you uh, don't want it to. So it might be that you need to tweak an algorithm, or it might be that you have to change a policy um, and, and in terms of how the humans interpret that number or what other information they're allowed to take into account or what tests have to be done you know, before something like this is applied. So then we, we saw impact, which was that we were people were able to have a debate about automated systems just from speculating or having concrete uh, examples of how that system might be impacting different communities differently. So in the Compass debate, 
you know, they are able to kind of do input and output testing and have concrete examples of how different, differently that system was treating different communities of people. And that alone, you know, with a little bit of context, um, was able to spark this important debate, um, even when the, the, the researchers didn't have access to the underlying code. Um, and so if you, and, and same with that, if you go back to that um, soap dispenser, right? You didn't know anything else about the dispenser, but you saw that it was treating people differently. And so that's what we mean when we, when we say impact. If, if there's a sort of an observable um, consequence, you can, you can start a conversation there and then ask more questions. But it really did lead to a, a hook in a lot of the cases we saw. It was just pointing out how it could be treating people differently. So the, then we go back to policies, which I mentioned. These are really critical when the constitution of the system includes a hu human agency at some level. Yeah. But it also, it doesn't have to. It might also be, what is the threshold? Uh, you know, how, like if the system predicts with 75% accuracy that someone's going to do something, does that mean positive or negative? Or is there, is there does it come out with like a, a, a score or a scale or a color? Like these are, policies are the things that are defining that. Um, so this, an example of this becoming relevant was when uh, Facebook's internal um, content moderation guidelines were released. And so this is not, these are not the policies that are made public about, you know, we don't allow hate speech and, and things like that. These are how they internally define hate speech to their content moderators in such an exact way that the moderators have very little uh, uh, ability to kind of include their own opinion. And so when, I think it was The Guardian, released these documents, there was uproar because uh, you could see that it's very, like the line is, is kind of hazy, but it's, you know, if you hate a specific group of people, that's not allowed, but if you hate like the concept of that group of people, <laughs> that is allowed. Um, there was another case where you couldn't disparage uh, an entire group of people, but you could disparage a subset of a group of people. So the headline, I think, in ProPublica was, uh, Facebook al allows hate speech against black children but not white men um, because white men was like a descriptor and then a class of people whereas black children, children are a subset of black people. Um, and, and that, you know, that piece of information, that negative information from these internal policies um, led people to question the content moderation system which is a mix of humans and of, of automated flagging. Um, and it kind of, the amount of human to automation kind of depends on the context. So I think terrorist content is slightly more automated because Facebook's under pressure to take it down more rapidly, whereas hate speech content, you know, might not be immediately taken down because they're trying to balance free speech interests um, and, and hate speech concerns. So understanding the policies that are governing the leave up or take down decision um, are really important to understanding the automated decision system broadly, that is Facebook's content moderation. So then, uh, another piece of information you can have without the code itself is what data is going into that system, uh, or to, to train that system, and what's coming out. Um, for instance, this is about, this is outputs of the decision. So this is the, um, for the compass algorithm, which is attempting to predict a defendant's uh, risk of recidiv recidivism, which in some states means um, failure to appear for a future court hearing, in some states it means that, or committing a dangerous um, new crime, and a, knowing that is also important. <laughs> what are you trying to predict? That goes back to the purpose. Um, and, but, so they're, they're assigning defendants a, a score, but what, and that's a numerical score, but what judges get is this sort of table of like, what does that score mean for what decision should be made? So it's kind of filtered through an output. So understanding that the system is providing a numerical score that's then kind of uh, framed in reference to a, um, a decision-making framework, that's important to, to think about you know, how are judges uh, able to interpret the output of this automated decision system. Another thing for, for um, that's relevant in this category of inputs and outputs for, for risk scores is 
this debate between whether you can use as an input into the predictive system um, arrest data or whether you want to use conviction data as the you know the triggering event for this person might be a higher risk and you can imagine you can imagine why that is a relevant thing to know because in some cities you might have clear <coughs> evidence of over policing or um, disparate policing across neighborhoods where arrest data um, would be problematic to include when you're trying to make a prediction about the behavior of the defendant um, whereas conviction data might be a little bit more um, acceptable uh, because it's gone through some kind of process but even there I was at the um, a conference the other week where they brought in it was about a month ago they brought in someone who'd gone through um, the bail system to kind of talk about the human side of, of what that's like and he pointed out that he, he had gone through one time he had uh, been released on bail and another time he had not been released on bail and some defendants have a compelling interest to plead guilty if it will get them out of a dangerous um, jail situation or if it will mean the guarantee of a lesser sentence instead of the uncertainty of a longer sentence but possibly going free and so while they might be convicted and charged and, and, and sort of um, classified as having pled guilty that doesn't necessarily Excuse me, that doesn't necessarily mean they were guilty. So even arrest versus conviction data is something we're thinking about. Like, is there a different piece of data that we could have been using to train this model um, that would more appropriately um, feed into the purpose that we've defined the system as? So looking at both the data that's going in and then looking at the data that's coming out can tell you a lot about an automated decision system. Um, I guess that kind of bleeds into training data. So we were, um, in the inputs and outputs, it's, we were thinking about what type of data is going in and out, so the arrest data versus conviction data and, and the scores that are coming out. When we're talking about training data, we might look at what was the actual set of data that was used to train this model. Was it um, inclusive? Did it, uh, did it, you know, are we looking at data from our community or is it, are we looking at it from, um, somewhere else. So I know in some predictive risk models in the courtroom, they're training on a national data set, but that might not actually apply well locally because um, gun crimes, for instance, at a national level might appear to be violent or like gun possession, Where, but in a state that allows gun possession and someone's arrested with a gun on them, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a higher risk than they are elsewhere. Whereas in a state where there are really strict gun laws, catching someone with a gun might indicate that they really are a much higher risk for a violent crime. And so thinking about what data was used to train this model, is that appropriate for the use case in the context that we're, that we're looking at? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, this is just sort of basic statistical things. Or like, are there um, uh, proxies in the data that was, that was used? Um, you know what? What are what are the historical contexts for the data set that ended that we ended up training on? And I think we've found that a lot of programmers who are training automated systems on a set of data don't necessarily have the background to think critically about the data that they're looking at. They're like, oh, this is data. I can train something on it, um, and not think about you know what data is missing from this this particular data set. Um, what data was collapsed into sort of higher level categories in a way that aggregate something that we ought to disaggregate. Um, how is the, there's, um, Paul Ohm at Georgetown has a good paper on the legal, what lawyers ought to know about automated decisions, and they go into kind of the data cleaning and processing um, step of machine learning and, and talk through some of the issues that might arise there um, and why that's relevant to thinking about automated decisions. And then, then once we have all of those other pieces, then source code might be appropriate to demand. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be helpful if you don't know what you're asking of it. If you you kind of have to think about um, if you, if there was an observable impact you want to test for to see if the software explicitly led to that. Um, it's helpful to know that before looking through the source code. Otherwise, you know, especially if it's a machine learned model um, or if it's sort of like a model of multiple programs, it's going to be difficult to comb through source code, especially 
which is what we were looking at, which was really unsophisticated public interest researchers who don't have the capacity to do that. So, um, and also, you know, you, have, you want to be like thinking about is the source code the relevant point of decision here, or was it the human? So, um, you know, understanding the constitution of a system can help you figure out how how important it is to have access to the source code for a particular line of inquiry, or do you want, are you looking for something more like the policies, or are you looking for some kind of um, impact assessment? Um, do you really need the source code? So just to kind of apply that framework to the stories that I brought up to, to look at um, how they come into play in actual instances of scrutiny of automated decisions, for, for the Republica case, it started with the understanding that courts were using these models, and then the researchers were able to take the next step and, and do a whole you know, long FOIA process for all sorts of data about it. Wouldn't have been able to do that if they didn't know that courts were using it. Um, recognizing exactly what the models were meant to predict and what their definition of success was, if it was um, failure to appear in court or whether it was um, recommitting a crime, that was important to contextualize the data that they were able to analyze. Understanding that this is not AI making court decisions, which is how a lot of the um, media covered it as. It's very you know, disturbing and scary and, and a popular headline, but that's not the case in almost any of the um, predictive risk assessment situations. It's um, a linear, a score that's basically linear regression. Um, that is applied to, that is maybe put in the back of a file in court that maybe judges look at and maybe they don't. There's some good research out of Stanford um, saying that because judges are sort of an expert profession, they're prone to ignore these scores because they feel like they have a lot of experience here and they don't want to be told what to do by you know, some sort of automated system that they don't understand. And so under, like, while that didn't come out in the initial article per se, it was a, a big part of follow-on conversations to investigate what's the role of these systems in the courtroom and you know, how, how much influence do they have um, and where does discretion come into play. And this is actually take away the bias that we think um, these systems are claiming to take away. If judges still retain, um, retain some kind of uh, agency, then maybe it's not actually serving the purpose. Um, my colleagues have a paper out called uh, Danger Ahead um, about predict prediction and fail, and one of their recommendations is that in, in order to uh, account for the fact that these systems inevitably are going to treat different populations differently because of the way that the administrative data going in um, affects it, they recommend that at lower risk scores, uh, or that the judges should be able to like ratchet a decision down, but not up. So if a, if a risk score is sort of in the middle, um, they should it should generally recommend release, um, and they can they can lower it down, but they shouldn't be able to take a low risk score and sort of apply their discretion to say, actually, we want to detain this person, even though the score said they're low, um, and that might help balance out some of the impact of that system. As we've talked about, the disparate error rates by race were a really key part of this decision, so just looking at that piece of data helped um, add some insight to the public conversation. Understanding the, the shape of the score was really important. And understanding what data was going in here. So it was a mix of uh, sort of ob objective data, like age and location uh, where the person grew up and, and some biographical data, but it was also based on interview data of intake of defendants where um, the, the interviewer could kind of assign their own judgment to, to what the person was saying. And so, you know, what what are they what, what what might they be adding to that data set that wasn't there before, what bias might be coming into that. Um, so that was an important uh, part of this too, as well as that distinction between arrest and conviction um, to understand whether the out, outcome uh, the output of the system was as unbiased as it was being claimed to be even with its error rate. So for the Patriot missile, it's a little bit more simple, but um, basically 
they did a sweeping investigation. They were they looked at the source code. The source code was correct. It was um, the system was perfectly able to do their calculating trajectory over time. It and it had been um, uh, there had been a bug where because the number of digits in the clock was like limited, it couldn't account for um, change over time, or they hadn't uh, something like that where it, there was a rounding error, and that's what had led to a problem in the first place. But the software had been fixed, and yet the missile still failed. And so what they realized was they were they had to interview a lot of people, and they realized that that particular base had not installed the software update, the patch. And so that was what led to the failure, not the system itself. And so just showing that we've learned this lesson in the past, that you have to look holistically at, at how systems like these are used, um, you know, where, er, where the, the, the weak point might have been and what led to the outcome that you're trying to investigate. And then in Facebook trending stories, there were two phases to this. So the first phase was that the system, which was a mix of automated um, ranking and human editors, um, was accused of bias against conservative news outlets. That was the impact people were observing or purporting to observe. Um, understanding that it was that mix of automated ranking and humans was important to, to think about who, you know, what was leading to that outcome. And then thinking about what the policies were, you know, the, the company claimed that that they didn't have any policies that were leading to that, and so maybe it was just the humans thinking about, um, you know, bringing their own perspective on what is what was a credible news source. Um, that was an important thing to recognize too. But they were getting a lot of pressure from conservative lawmakers and others, and so they decided to take the humans out of the picture and rely entirely on automation. <laughs> the outcome was that there were immediately more false stories um, that were getting propagated up. Um, at that point, it was entirely automated. So then we could have a conversation, and the company could consider, do we care enough about this feature to uh, let the outcome happen in this new way we built the product? Is it worth going back to having humans? Well, that didn't work either. So uh, last I saw, they don't have that section of <laughs> the news feed anymore um, because they were not able to solve it by, uh, by fixing any of the pieces that we identified here. So that was those were that was what we were able to distill from the case studies, um, and then recognizing that there are so many different components of automated systems, we wanted to look to see how different parts of these systems were governed, and we saw a lot of different approaches. And so it's not just um, you know I think we're having a debate right now about like how do we govern technology and govern um, automated systems, and there's a lot of well we should have. We should study it. We don't understand it, <laughs> um, and we should, you know, maybe antitrust and, and like come back to me later because it's still very unclear. But there are actually a lot of ways people are governing these components of systems. So first, we have the data that's going in. What data is allowed to be used? Um, you know, how does that? kind of intersect with privacy interests if we're talking about data about people. Um, so in Europe, um, data protection uh, gives people the ability to uh, consent to what data can be used in automated decisions, except not in law enforcement context, not in national security context. So um, you can see where this approach can be effective in some cases and ineffective in other cases. Um, and, and we saw a number of different examples of this all over the world where privacy, it's privacy regulation that's thinking about what data can be collected and how can it be used and in some cases um, how can this data uh, be integrated into an automated process. How automated does it have to be in order to trigger this privacy protection? Um, you know, this came up in the U.S. around uh, the national security conversation around how much metadata can be collected by the NSA to to do analysis of U.S. citizens. And so, this was really about what data can be collected. Now, one of the weaknesses of this approach is that we generally consumers don't necessarily know or care how this data is used. And so, while some people might opt to exercise discretion and say, I don't want data collected about me. It doesn't stop companies or other actors from collecting other data and 
still using it to make decisions about people. So it's kind of, while it's an individual remedy, it's a collective harm. And so it doesn't necessarily solve some of the harder problems when we're talking about automated decisions when you're um, grouping people or, or sort of predicting things about them. Um, it just stops them from using your particular use case in that data, which I, it actually might end up being harmful because if the data set's not representative, it might end up having a higher error rate in certain cases. Um, and so this is effective in some sense and, and, and challenged in other senses. The transparency was another, uh, another obvious piece here. And by this I mean, very broadly, we see general uh, right to information laws where people can request information about, about government uses of these systems or government agencies are required to disclose impact assessments or the fact that they're using automated decision systems, for instance. Um, but also, there's debate now about how much source code needs to be transparent. So um, that's also a piece here. Um, the open records laws in general were a huge part of a lot of the cases we saw of, um, you know, just FOIAing of like, are you send us all, all the details of any system that's using computational analysis or statistical prediction um, so that we can kind of figure out what's going on in there and then, and then ask follow-up questions. But just recently, France actually uh, is, uh, passed a law mandating that government uh, automated systems will have to disclose the source code, um, which is pretty interesting and something that we see the opposite of in the U.S. where trade secret laws, trade secrecy laws, are preventing defendants even in court from challenging um, automated decisions. In particular, a big case that's coming up that has come up recently is um, probabilistic DNA analysis, um, where it's trying to predict if someone's DNA matches um, DNA that was found on the scene, but defendants are not able to contest um, those predictions because this tool, which is being used by law enforcement, is shielded by trade secrecy laws. So this is the tension between transparency and, and kind of trade secrecy. Um, also, we saw a couple of narrow cases in the US where uh, federal agencies are required to disclose um, data mining. This was back in 2007. Um, this past, it's not clear if all agencies are actually reporting <laughs> on this. There have been, we couldn't find very many reports of agencies uh, uh, kind of complying with this law. <laughs> um, it might be folded into privacy impact assessments that um, that agencies are, are also required to do, but it doesn't seem to have much teeth, and so the concept of it is good, but um, we're not sure how effective it is. But we also did, we did see uh, one narrow example, which is in the airline booking industry that Congress went in and said, you know, um, you have to disclose the ranking factors uh, for, for your uh, flight reservation system because you're, we're seeing that you're prioritizing um, you know, certain uh, airlines or partners and, and that's not cool. Um, so, Transparency could apply to many of the different components of automated systems, automated systems that we identified, um, and we don't. We think that it, more uh, regulatory approaches can be applied to some more of the inputs and outputs, or the the, um, the policies around systems. So the fact that it exists is a really important piece that you know a government could require um, companies to disclose that they're using a certain predictive system or that a government agency is using a, is using a predictive system. That would start important conversations even without requiring source code disclosure. So as you're thinking about accountability and algorithms, I, I think about what else could we ask to be transparent that doesn't necessarily threaten um, trade secret laws. I think when, when do we need the really robust full um, transparency requirements that might challenge um, some of those protections. Another thing that many people uh, were, were talking about, and I'll just add that when we were talking about these governance approaches, we interviewed people, um, we interviewed advocacy groups all over the world to, to, to ask them when they were trying to learn more about automated decision systems, what um, mechanisms were letting them do that. So some of this information is, is hearing from them about what regulatory levers they were able to use. 
a lot of there was a lot of excitement about the European new right to explanation, and also a lot of trepidation about whether it actually goes as far as people think it does, um, and and how broad the exceptions are. Um, so GDPR uh, provides people with a meaningful information about the logic involved in in fully automated decisions made about them. Now, that is kind of narrow because nobody knows what meaningful information means yet. Um, there's a great paper by uh, Andrew Speltz and Solomon Barocas about, um, about the right to explanation and why that's a slippery sort of notion because I think the example they give is, let's say you have a glass and you drop the glass and you want an explanation about why the glass broke. Now, that explanation could be because you dropped it. It could be because the force of the floor is greater than glass. <laughs> it's like a physical explanation. Or it could be because somebody scared you and then you dropped it. Like, there's many different ways to think about what an explanation would mean. And people who are looking for those explanations might have different expectations of what they are. So we're still not sure how that would play out. Um, also, the sort of how, how fully automated does a decision have to be to trigger this? As we saw many times, there are uh, humans in the loop at some point. I think it was the Article 29 working group, working party in Europe, which um, kind of comes out with guidance about these, it recently came out with guidance saying that a human has to have a meaningful ability to over, over, uh, overcome this decision for that to, to not be triggered. Um, it can't just be like a, a token human <laughs> um, to mean that it's not fully automated, but again, that's something that we still don't quite know. And do we? Is it really only fully automated decisions we're concerned about, or is it these decisions that lead to some kind of score or output that then a human interprets that then leads to um, an an outcome on the human subject that we're still concerned about? So this it it. it it, it's, it's an interesting novel new um, approach here, but it's so narrow when we're talking about the universe of automated decisions um, that it just doesn't capture as much as in the rhetoric around it would imply that it captures. In the US, uh, a really strong example we saw of explanation was the Fair Credit Reporting Act, where you actually get you know, at least four, I think, key factors that affected um, your credit score, and because of that, because we've heard from financial regulators or, or people who work in credit scoring, credit scoring context, they're very hesitant to use machine learning tools because they are not confident that they can um, uh, fully represent what those factors are, and they're aware that this law constrains um, their ability to use that output. And so, um, this is while well, a legacy law, something that's it, it continues to remain effective in the context of, of credit and any ter like secondary use of credit scores like um, housing and uh, you know job applications that use credit scores. So um, that's kind of put a, an upper limit on how complex these automated decisions can be because they do have to provide that explanation. So we saw that anti-discrimination was an effective way to um, to govern the outcome of these decisions. So when we're looking at job applications, a job, uh, an automated system that leads to job applications, no matter how automated it is, they're still, at least in theory, subject to the disparate treatment and disparate impact um, tests for hiring. And so if you could gather enough information to show that a, an automated system led to a disparate impact on applicants, you could contest, and you could challenge that system, and it would, as our, on our reading, still cover that system. The problem is it's really difficult to gather the cases. It's difficult for an individual who's kind of going through one of these systems to know, A, whether it was automated in the first place, and to know why they were rejected, and to, to find other people who were in the same boat so that they could bring a challenge. And so while in theory, this you know these types of laws govern that output, in practicality, it's really difficult to uh, make the case. Other other countries have sort of similar laws that prohibit, you know, any sort of discriminatory treatment um, based on real or perceived attributes. And so there are a lot of people thinking about, you know, what data can we use in this uh, system that um, 
that wouldn't uh, violate these laws and and when we're looking at the output, how much can we adjust the model? Um, like how much should we be adjusting the model that accounts for, that, that's taking in sort of historical data but we know that it's leading to a disparate impact. So that's an ongoing conversation. Um, there's also a really interesting case here where for some, for some systems, in order to understand whether they are discriminatory, you need to collect more information about the people that, that um, are being impacted. You need to collect race information or other demographic information. Otherwise, you might have proxies in your data that you don't recognize, but that clashes with privacy interests of not collecting that data. And also, we want to make sure that when you collect that data, it's not used in the model. It's just used to check the model. And so, it's, um, I think Sorel Friedler has some interesting uh, research about this, about um, what's the right balance between uh, protect privacy protective systems and collecting more um, information that you can use to um, detect and uh, mitigate inadvertent discrimination that's happening within these systems. Another one is, you know, let's say you've given uh, an entity the right to use your data, but what if the data that they collect about you turns out to be wrong or it changes? Um, so we saw a number of cases where data access and redress was a way that systems were, um, were being governed. So South American, Central American uh, advocacy groups were telling us that they, they have very little idea of how governments are using automated decisions, but because there's, um, they have a right to um, understand how their data is being used, this data access question, they're using that as a way to try and query different administrative agencies or governments to know what automated decisions are being used. So they're using this personal right to data as a way to look for that existence bucket, um, what's being used. And then, um, in other contexts, once a system is being used, there are, in, in the US and Europe, um, you have a little bit more of a right to uh, challenge the particular data that a company has, or you know, get it, like obtain it from from the entity and then make changes. So in the US, the Fair Credit Reporting Act has that. In the EU, the GDPR will have that. I think um, a couple of professors and, and, and activists have requested their data from the big tech companies through, through the European law in order to discern what types of decision and decisions and profiling are happening on that platform because the company, you know, they don't think the company is being forthcoming about how their data is being used. So they're using this access um, mechanism to learn more about the automated decision side of things. I'm almost done and then. <laughs> um, then we saw cases where uh, people said, you know, this is not something we want, this, this system is too dangerous to use now, or, or we want people to not have to uh, be subject to it at all because you know, either it's too dangerous or, you know, the right of the person, of the individual is so strong that it ought to overcome the interest of, of the, the entity using that system. So we saw in Europe also, people can opt out of those fully automated decisions. And again, we don't know how effective that will be because it's on that individual level. But we also saw prohibitions of certain types of decisions altogether, um, fully automated decisions within the court context in France, um, ban, you know, calls for bans on autonomous weapon systems. Um, because the, the, the risk of harm is so high that people think they not, it ought not to exist, right? And then, uh, you know, do we require validation of the models? Do we require, do we require that um, they do testing for demographic parity um, or accuracy? And, you know, is there some sort of pre-market certification that we need in different contexts? So we saw that governing um, gambling systems. The, the randomization algorithms have to be pre-certified so that you know there's no there's no cheating. Um, also, uh, the GDPR and and some uh, some people in the U.S. are calling for impact assessments to not necessarily come out with computational or quantitative um, certification or validation, but to at least kind of think through the impact that a system might have before it's deployed. And auditability. Um, so once it's deployed, can you go in and check that the that the uh, 
the software is behaving as it was promised to behave, especially in regulated areas. Again, that's the, the gaming software. Um, I believe in financial contexts that also comes up um, so that you can go back and check to see, uh, to do that sort of software testing when software really was the thing that caused the problem. And then competition um, is, is, a, is a company improperly prioritizing their own products and search results, for instance. That would be one way that regulators have kind of brought pressure to bear on automated decisions. Um, in the, uh, the FTC was investigating Google for that. Um, and basically, they didn't end up enforcing against Google, but it, you know, at least we think they kind of scared Google a little bit. And and Europe certainly did, um, and enforced the largest fine that any tech company has ever <laughs> suffered um, for prioritizing their own shopping. And that was, you know, you could read that as governing an automated decision. Liability is one that's come up a lot. You know, who, you know, who's, who's liable if the robot kills somebody? <laughs> is it the programmer? Is it the operator? Is it the company that owns the robot? Um, in the UK, European commissioners have called for like robot personhood to, to, to calm this down. I think Japan just decided that for autonomous vehicles, they'll be the owner of the vehicle that's liable unless there's an extremely clear reason why the software caused the problem. I think that's interesting. I'm not sure how correct it is. <laughs> um, and with that, <laughs> I would love to any questions or comments people have or thoughts. We have about eight, seven or eight minutes for questions, so I'll open it up to the floor. So I have a question about, you talked in one of your case studies about at the sentencing phase having data and impact that. Um, I recently read an article about a Silicon Valley company called Palantir, mm -hmm. and a partnership that they have with an actual city mm -hmm. influencing where the police will do their work. Uh, have you looked into the implications of that? Yeah, so my colleagues did a big study of predictive policing um, a year or two ago. So that would certainly be one of the uh, a type of case that you could apply here. So that also was based on policing data, right? Where where police go, crime happens, or at least that's where we see that crime happens. It's the what's the, you know the the street light effect, um, <laughs> and so but but also understanding what information is given to police once that. Um, that sort of prediction comes up. So in some cases, it's uh, place-based. So if police are given, you know, you should go to this neighborhood at this time, and it's like a red box on a map, and they don't necessarily have a sense of what or who is, is gonna come up, but they're going to that person on a map. In, in Chicago, it's assigning a score to people. And so that might lead to a different type of risk where if, a, if an officer is given um, information that a certain person is high risk, that could lead to an entirely different um, risk profile, like what the system is causing. Um, I think you know the challenge with all these systems is that for a long time they were secret. It wasn't clear who was using them. With Palantir, it wasn't clear that there was this partnership with like data, you know, this freaky data processing uh, company. Um, what data is going into that system? You know, what are they using it for? Who has access? Um, what sort of constraints are on there? So certainly, that's the type of case study that we're hoping to empower more reporters and researchers to ask questions of, you know, even if they can't demand like the source code, because that's not actually the thing we care about in those cases. It's that it's being used at all, you know, what it's leading people to do and how much um, reflection, you know, uh, law enforcement is, is, is undertaking about the consequences of using those types. So if we could uh, refine that a little bit more, um, in that the police are basically, you know, under HR systems, which are encouraging them to make more arrests mm -hmm. in order to advance their careers. The prosecutors are under a similar system where they're encouraged to make more convictions to advance theirs, and those two entities are deeply dependent upon one another. If the police screw a prosecutor, they're, they're not going to be able to make convictions. Um, yeah, and vice versa. If the police are too hard on the cops, they won't be able to make arrests. So you have this feedback loop, which it's hard to argue which is the more pernicious thing, the automated systems that are making the decisions, or that feedback loop, which is you know, structuring the context in which they're going to be used. Mm -hmm. 
And if you wanted to like, disentangle yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's two pieces there. So one is that we shouldn't presume that data that exists is data that ought to be deployed, mm -hmm. right? Because in so few cases are we thinking about why that data exists in the form that it exists. Um, and yeah, the second piece is that sort of the, the sexiness of AI and machine learning to do this is making a lot of people forget the best practices in, in using data-based um, policy in the past. Like what, what does it mean to use this data? What social trends is putting this into an automated system going to um, crystallize and hide in the future? And I think that's again why we wanted to do this research to um, encourage that questioning because a lot of things here is like if you're looking at the past um, to pick up patterns, you're going to project those patterns into the future. Mm. But there are a lot of patterns that we as a society want to change. <laughs> and so by, um, by automating them without appropriate you know, reflection and thought, we're just going to do that um, in a way that makes it harder to change in the future, especially if companies that are doing this are protected from disclosing different factors about their system. And that's not only source code, but in perhaps including, but certainly what data they're using and you know what tests they're doing to make sure that they're, or, or to at least disclose what patterns they've detected that they're using, because that's a debate that society still needs to have. Um, and how they're handling outliers of their data. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think I I think it's really interesting to think about prediction in general and in social context because it, statistics can help, um, but we have a really weak sense of causation in a lot of these cases. So uh, there's the idea of um, you know there's no more need for hypotheses. The data is just going to tell us um, like what we need to know. We don't have to test against it, and and we can just build a system, tell, see what the data says, and then use it to um, to fix all of our problems. And that's just not the case. And I think there's um, a lot of open questions about you know which of these systems require more thoughtful sort of scientific type of testing of you know what's the appropriate intervention like in the bail context you know just assigning people risk scores and then detaining some people and letting other people go um, what that's doing is making it really difficult to determine if new interventions like um, texting people a reminder of their court date mm -hmm. might actually help them come you know get make it to court where they wouldn't have otherwise in the past but now that they've been judged a high risk there's not even a chance to test that new policy intervention so you know what does applying a certain automated decision um, mean that we're preventing ourselves from learning in the future about new policy um, approaches and and what is the moral uh, you know the, the what how do we feel morally about using statistics to like predict individuals behavior knowing that it's really nearly impossible to capture every possible um, input into that person's decision making um, and I think that's something that you know how that like What's that? That opens the question of what is uh, your ability to challenge these decisions? What does due process look like? Um, you know, how do you make sure that these are not determinative um, in all cases? And, and and in the cases where there's a real life impact, like you're going to jail, you're going to get shot, <laughs> you're going to get arrested. Um, you know, how how careful do we really need to be about deploying these systems um, because it might be irrevocable, it might inflict irrevocable harm. I just wanted to add one quick thing. One thing that Will's question kind of suggested to me too was that, um, you know, we've been talking about collecting data like of criminals, right? But what about collecting data on the prosecutors and mm -hmm. on the judges themselves, right? Yeah. As a way to sort of balance the. Yeah. Right. There's some interesting conversations about um, police body worn cameras and looking at. Um, you know, taking video from that and using it to come up with predictive analytics. Um, law enforcement is certainly interested in using that to in include in predictive policing systems. But yeah, you could also exactly turn it around. You no. could monitor police uh, um, behavior. You could monitor language. You could yeah, you could predict stress levels, right? You could detect if someone maybe you should be taken off the beat for a little while. Yeah, you could predict misconduct. My point is though that there are power structures that are putting these algorithms. Mm -hmm. right? okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know it's that's that's I think that's part of the challenge here is like who who is deploying these systems, who has the ability to um, comment on them. Um, I know New York City is trying to make it so that any administrative use of automated systems um, has to go through sort of uh, I think there's an impact assessment or like a public comment. I don't know if they're going to do public comment, but they're interested in at least disclosing their use so that we could have this debate over who should own this data, who gets to define the policies. Um, I think that's why we, the Constitution and the policies are really important here because in so many cases maybe somebody owns the system, but if you can have a public conversation about the policy governing that system, that might help, or what data goes into it. Um, so we think that, like, our, our overall uh, conclusion from this, this paper was that we just need more exploratory scrutiny so we can have these conversations about who's deploying it. Is it, um, is it appropriate use? Is the data going in appropriate? Um, and that's gonna get us so much further than demanding source code at this point. Um, yeah, we can have real concrete conversations about what accountability in certain contexts looks like. Um, and and it, at least in the US, that sort of sectoral approach is how we do policy anyway. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, there are some more, there's more broader approaches, but it's still, we find it really difficult to have the conversations when nobody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> nobody has a real grasp on what the harm is and can really demonstrate that. Um, and so we talk in broad generalities about the value of privacy and the value of, of, of autonomy and the ability to decide whether you're, you, you uh, agree to be subjected to these decisions or not. That doesn't really get us to a point where we think we need to go, which is that there are certain use cases where different types of treatment are more appropriate. There are other ones that maybe are less consequential, but you know, they're more consequential for certain groups and therefore the policies can be adjusted different things like that. So, um, very, yeah, point well taken. <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much for coming.